About 25 years ago, I came across a vortex tube, which is also called a Hilsch tube. It's a three-terminal passive device that takes a pressurized gas input and delivers a hot stream of gas on one output and a cold stream on the other. If you'll notice the picture below, it is quite a simple device. It usually takes about 100 psi uh, pressure drop to run one of these devices. And this next slide shows simply how the airstream flows, how it comes in the input, goes through a vortex spinning motion, goes out on the hot side, or at least the outside shell does. The middle is reflected back towards the other side, which uh, that's where the cold air comes out. To analyze the vortex tube system, we are going to look at the steady flow energy equation from thermodynamics. Uh, that says Q or heat minus work equals mass flow times enthalpy plus velocity square over 2 plus gravity times Z, which is also equal to energy. But this vortex tube does not do any work. And because of that, W is, goes to zero. Um, also, remember, since the pressure and size of this device is not changing, the mass flow in equals the mass flow out, or M1 dot equals M2 dot plus M3 dot. Uh, next to each one of the ports is an equation uh, for each one of the energies, and essentially you do some algebraic manipulations, you'll get E1 equals E2 plus E3. The term gravity times Z, if the tube is oriented so that it has the same baseline distance, essentially Z is equal to zero, and since it's uh, zero, then that term goes to zero. Also, the V squared term is usually for these small systems <clears throat> very small and can be neglected. So essentially what we end up with is energy equals M dot H or the enthalpy at the specific temperature. There is also a Q term that is relative because this is a non-isolated system and, and it's not isolated from the environment. So we would normally include that. However, a special case is a vortex tube with the input at ambient. The hot end is actually bleeding energy to the uh, uh, environment. However, the cold end is getting energy from the environment. So it turns out it should be almost balanced. So we're going to consider that to be a small parameter as well. And so what we end up in is, as you notice at the bottom of the slide, is m.1 h1 equals m.2 h2 plus m.3 h3. And this is what we hope to prove with our testing. Any experiment is dependent on the meters that are used or the measuring equipment, and this is no exception. I obtained a Sierra Instruments mass flow meter, which was just recently calibrated. It's accurate within 1.5% of full scale. However, unfortunately, it only ran 175 standard liters per minute, and I needed something somewhere around 4 to 500. I created the meter, as you see in the picture, with a bypass on it, with a uh, bypass control, which is simply just a valve, uh, which allows me a change by a ratio of 7.947 to 1, so that the full scale meter reading on the voltmeter, instead of being 0 to 175, is 0 to 1391 standard liters per minute. And that brings up another issue. Rather than use the monitor that was on the meter, which seemed to jump around a lot, I used the plug-in for the 0 to 5 volt full scale meter. And then I used a voltmeter. And I put in place a low pass filter to filter out as much noise as I could. It improved the reading and uh, gave me pretty good success. However, once I did all that, there was some calibration or some conversion factors to take care of. This next slide indicates all the ratios and numbers and going from standard liters per minute to actually 
grams per liter to actual mass flow number and it shows all the calculations there. Essentially the bottom line is you take the volt meter reading times 334 and you will get grams per minute. One other thing that was uh, related to the meter is it did have a thermal band that would only work in. It, it was not supposed to go above 50 degrees C. I wasn't sure if that was going to be a problem or not. So I have this radiator. It's a, a kind of small one in the picture there that I attached prior to going through the meter on the hot and the cold side and a little fan that ran it. And so anytime you see the three meters sitting there, the one in the middle is the temperature of the gas coming out of the thermal adjuster. As long as it's below 50 degrees uh, C, uh, I'm not sure what that is in F, uh, we're okay, but it, it hung right around ambient, so it actually gave me pretty good results. The meter on the left would be the voltmeter for the mass flow, and, and of course I have a four position thermometer to the right that shows the actual different ports, T1 being the input, T2 being uh, the hot side, and T3 being the cold. The next three slides show the test setups for the input and the hot side and the cold side, and it shows that I moved the mass flow meter around. The only critical input is the input pressure is 100 PSI, and then the vortex allowed to reach uh, stabilization wherever it decides to go. I had one limitation on my compressor. I had to bring it up to 120 PSI, and we ran it until the compressor dropped to 105 PSI. It couldn't quite keep up with the vortex tube, but I could get about a minute, 45, almost two minutes worth of testing. Um, that may have some uh, effect of the results, but it turns out it wasn't significant. I also ran uh, five different uh, tests, one on the input and two on both the cold and the hot side to make sure that I've reached some sort of equilibrium. I did not include the entire tape of the testing as you are listening to this, you're watch watching some of the testing. As I say, uh, it was about two minutes each. It would have been six minutes worth of testing, and it does get rather boring, so I actually have summarized the results in a table. Fortunately, we were using a camera to collect the data, and we could go back to the movie, and every three seconds with the timestamp, record the data, and we're able to take our time to do that. Uh, we waited until the vortex tube stabilized out, but uh, that's how we were able to collect uh, 60 seconds worth of data every three seconds. The next slide, I took and plotted those numbers. Um, and there's the legend to the right. I also uh, put uh, three trend lines, one on the input and one on each of the second run of both the cold and the hot because I think there was some cold soak or heat soaking going on that it didn't quite reach equilibrium mainly because in between each test I had to move the mass flow meter and that did take a bit of a time so the uh, tube would head towards ambient. So the what the, the data on the plotted uh, trend line looks very interesting if you'll note that the slope is exactly the same on every line and so that actually gives me a pretty good feeling. It's, it's very small. My gut feeling is it's relative to the pressure regulator and the uh, compressor losing some pressure from 120 down to 105 PSI, but I'm not really sure. So sticking that into analysis table at the, the uh, time equals 60 seconds and running the numbers where I took the mass flow in versus hot and cold and see how they compare the in versus the hot plus the cold. The numbers were within 99%. Um, I thought that was very good. And the same thing when I took the temperatures and looked up in a gas table, the uh, enthalpy, of course, it gave it to me in uh, BTUs per pound, so I had to convert it to watt hours per gram. 
But again, uh, looking at the energy, it also uh, matched up fairly well too within 98%. So we can claim success on this experiment. We've shown that the vortex tube does follow some specific thermodynamic relationships that we well understand. So now we can use these relationships to uh, use vortex tubes in any product in the appropriate manner. I want to thank my son-in-law Charles Bicebay and my daughter Nicole Bicebay for helping me with this project. Uh, their camera came in, was invaluable in collecting data and also creating this presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.